All right, so in this video, I'm intending to talk about how we really go about using trigonometric identities um, to rewrite integral expressions and effectively to take an integral expression that we, that we previously couldn't work with and, and to make it workable. Um, before I get into the three different categories of trigonometric identities that we'll be using, it's important that you remember the six basic trig derivatives that you've learned in, in any first year calculus course. Um, I'm going to need to assume that we remember what the derivative of sine x is, what the derivative of cosine x is, what the derivative of tangent x is, and you can imagine what the other three I'm going to make you remember are, uh, the derivative of secant x, the derivative of cosecant x, and the derivative of cotangent x. The reason that it's important that you know all of these is that many problems still end up resorting to u-substitution, and if we don't know these things, we can't effectively use them as, as u-substitutions. So, you know, I, I would recommend you pause the video for a moment, make sure that you know all six of these, um, and then check them against that, and then we'll move forward with the methods that we have. So you should recall that the derivative of sine x is cosine x, the derivative of cosine x is negative sine x, the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x, the derivative of secant x is secant x times tangent x, the derivative of cosecant x is negative cosecant x times cotangent x, and finally the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared x. This should all absolutely be your view, and it's all going to be critical um, that we know it so that we can use uh, use substitutions when necessary. So the first category of, of identity that we're going to be working with as we go through this lesson today are the Pythagorean identities. Um, the Pythagorean identities come from the idea that they can be found and justified using a triangle and, and using, using the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so what we see here in, in the first one of them, and there are nine of these things total, um, but I, I want to be very clear in saying that for as much as there are nine, there's really only one of them that I have clearly memorized, and that's this one. Um, I hope that we all know that sine squared x plus cosine squared equals, equals 1. Um, Note that this could be could be rewritten. We could write this as sine squared x equals 1 minus cosine squared x. Similarly, I could write this as cosine squared x equals 1 minus sine squared x. Now, I want to be really clear. I, 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 I don't know that I memorize these two. I mean, sure, they're, they're up there rattling around my brain, but this is the one that I really remember. And what I think about when I consider all of these is I know that when I'm doing integration, when I'm working with problems, when I'm doing trig, I know that in general, sine squared x can be changed into cosine squared x. Now, there's always like a one minus that I have to deal with, but in general, I can change those things into one another. So when you're working through a problem and you have a sine squared and you wish it was a cosine squared, remember that you can use these Pythagorean identities. Now, I said that there were nine of them and I only covered three of them here. The other ones can be found by taking this identity, the sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1, and dividing through by either sine squared or by cosine squared, right? So if I were to divide each of these three terms by sine squared x, I would end up with 1 plus cosine squared divided by sine squared. That would give me cotangent squared x equals Oops, not one. That was a terrible mistake. Because uh, I'm dividing here by um, dividing here by sine squared. So this would be equals cosecant squared x. Okay. Um, so this now is another Pythagorean identity. Now, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but similar to the way that I did up here, I could rewrite this thing. I could move the one to the other side. I could move. Um, the cotangent of the, I mean, there's a number of ways that I could do this. But again, the, the, the thing that I'm at the end of the day going to remember here is that when I'm doing integration, cotangent squared x is allowed to change into cosecant squared x as long as I pay attention to where the 1 comes from. Okay, Similar to what I did before, I could also take this thing and divide instead by cosine squared. When I divide by cosine squared, I'll end up with tangent squared x plus 1 equals secant squared x, okay? So we have this sine cosine trig identity, we have this one that relates cosecant squared and cotangent, and we have this one that relates tangent squared and secant squared. If ever you're in a problem and you wish that you could change one trig, trig function into another one, the Pythagorean identities are often a very, very great way to do it. 
and we're going to be doing an example of that in just a moment. Okay, so in this example, you're being asked to take the antiderivative of tangent cubed x. Now, one of the first things that pops into my mind here is that we hopefully all remember from the first slide that the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. So there's a sense in which, like, if this problem had a secant squared in it, we could probably do some kind of a u substitution, but it doesn't have one. So we're kind of bummed that it doesn't have one. But if you remember from the previous slide, we, we kind of just developed a trigonometric identity for that. We picked up this idea that tangent squared x plus 1 equals secant squared x, right? Which means, if I rewrite this thing, that tangent squared x equals secant squared x minus 1. This allows me to change a tangent squared into a secant squared x minus 1. It's nice because right at the beginning of the problem, we were kind of wishing that we had a secant squared around. So my thought here is that we can take this problem and we can rewrite it as the integral of tangent x times tangent squared x, but let's change that tangent squared into secant squared x minus 1 dx. Okay? So now I've got this integral and I've got more pieces that I can, that I can use to, to work with this thing. So at this point, we can, we can distribute our tangent x through the problem. I'll have the integral of tangent x times secant squared x minus tangent x dx. And at this point, in some sense, we, we, we have what we wanted. This thing here is giving me the secant squared that I needed for a u substitution. The only challenge is that that secant squared isn't around to help out with this one. Like this one is kind of going to need to stand on its own. This one will do a u substitution. Right. So that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to split this integral into two pieces. We'll have the integral of tangent x secant squared x dx minus the integral of tangent x dx. As I mentioned before, this thing has the, the, you know, the, the du that we need to do a u substitution. This one doesn't, but fortunately we, hopefully, remember what the integral of tangent x is from our first year calculus course. Okay. So in, in this first problem here, um, I'm going to use my u as tangent x, my du is secant squared x. Um, and since this is a pretty straightforward one, I, I think I'm just going to go sort of straight into saying that we, we recognize that we would use this as our u, this would be our du, and so the integral of that would be 1 half u squared, in other words, 1 half tangent x squared. And then we'll have minus. Now the integral of tangent... Um, we just need to remember um, that the integral of tangent is the natural log of secant x plus c. Um, you may also remember this as being the negative natural log of cosine x plus c. Um, those two things would be interchangeable with one another. Um, and, and at that point, like, yeah, I mean, we're, we're done with the problem. We, we took the antiderivative that we needed to. This would be, one, wow, that was a highlighter, not what I wanted. Um, this would be 1 half tangent squared x minus the natural log of secant x plus c. And there you have it. So the next category of trig identity that we have to work with are the double angle identities. Um, and these can really be used either way. You can either use them to take a 2 sine x cosine x and change it into a sine 2x, or if, if necessary and if it would be helpful, you use it to change a double angle into single angles, you know, a, a combination of, of single angle trig um, functions. Um, the trig identity for sine only has sort of one version, 2 sine x cosine x. The cosine 2x, this is the most commonly written version of it, but in your IB formula book, you'll see that there are actually two other ways to go about it. And what they do is they, they utilize the fact that cosine squared can be changed into sine squared. So hopefully you recall that cosine squared x is the same as 1 minus sine squared x. If I take that and put it in right here where the cosine x is, I can find that cosine 2x could also be written as 1 minus 2 sine squared x, right? Similarly, if I, if I sort of did the same thing using, you know, swapping the positions of these two trig functions, I could end up getting that cosine 2x is equal to 2 cosine squared x minus 1. It's going to be up to you. It's going to be up to your, your judgment um, to sort of figure out which of these three things 
you know, the cosine squared sine squared, the 1 minus 2 sine squared x, or the 2 cosine squared x minus 1, which one of those best fits the problem that you're working with? Um, there's lots of ways that can come up, and we're going to go through one example here in just a moment. So the example we're working with here is the integral of cosine 2x over cosine x plus sine x. Um, I would like you to pause the video for a moment and take a look at the, the notes you just took and look over your options for end and identity for cosine 2x and see which of them makes the most sense. So hopefully you identified right off the bat that the one we should use is the cosine squared x minus sine squared x over cosine x plus sine x. If you did identify that right away, think for a second about why you chose it. And if you didn't choose that one and you're like, man, I couldn't tell which one, now that I've chosen that one, see if you can think of, of any reason, anything that's nice about this structure that would make it play nicely with the denominator. So I'm hoping that what you recognized is that is that this cosine squared minus sine squared should remind you a lot of your a squared minus b squared early factoring days. The difference is squares. That when you have one squared minus another square, you can factor it as a plus b and a minus b, which means that this expression here could be written as cosine x plus sine x times cosine x minus sine x. And in the denominator, we would still have our cosine x plus sine x dx. And what we notice now is that, I mean, this is fantastic. The top has a factor of cosine x plus sine x, and the bottom has a factor of cosine x plus sine x, which means those divide out to 1. And all I'm left with is the antiderivative of cosine x minus sine x dx. And what I like about this problem is that this problem doesn't even utilize u substitution. This is just a, hey, I used an identity. The identity broke this thing down into the combination of two very, very simple trigonometric functions, and we know the antiderivative of both of them. The antiderivative of cosine x is sine x, and the antiderivative of negative sine x is plus cosine x, and we get our constant of integration. Okay, So the double angle formulas can be used to change a double angle into a set of single angles that might we might be able to use to, 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 to divide out some other factor that we have. Now, I know this video is running really long, uh, but here I am on the last category of, of trig identities. Um, and these are the power reduction formulas. And these are actually really, really straightforward, but I wanted to show you where they came from. What I have written here is I have the two um, double angle formulas that we learned two slides ago, or that we reviewed two slides ago. What I'd like us to do here is, is solve both of these for cosine squared x or for sine squared x, right? So on the one on the left, if I, if I solve for cosine squared x, I end up getting cosine 2x plus 1 over 2 equals cosine squared x. Or written another way, cosine squared x equals 1 plus cosine 2x all over 2. Okay. On the right-hand side, I can sort of do a similar thing. I'm, I'm going to move the 2 sine squared x over and the cosine 2x over. So I'll have 2 sine squared x equals 1 minus cosine 2x. Dividing by 2, we'll get sine squared x equals 1 minus cosine 2x all over 2. And what we have here are what are called the power reduction formulas. Right? What they do is they allow you to take a cosine squared and reduce it to a cosine to the first power expression. We don't, well, previous to this video, we didn't know how to take the integral of cosine squared x or of sine squared x. Using these identities, you can change them into either of these expressions, which are then significantly easier to integrate. We're going to go ahead and go through an example of that in this last slide. So as promised, here is an integral of a sine squared 5x dx function. Um, this again is sine squared. Previous to this method, you would not have known how to do an integral like this of sine squared, but we're going to use the power reduction formula to do it. Right? Note from before that we remember that sine squared x is equal to 1 minus cosine 2x over 2. So the only catch here is that this problem has a 5x as the argument instead of x, but it just means that we're going to replace 5x here, which means we'll be replacing it here as well, like for, for the x portion. So I'm going to rewrite this integral as the integral of 1 minus cosine of 2 times 5x all over 2 dx. Because there's a subtraction here, I can actually split this into two separate uh, components. This would be 1 half minus 1 half cosine 10x dx. Uh, 
And now I'm just going to do this as two separate integrals. This will be the integral of 1 half dx minus 1 half the integral of cosine 10x dx. Okay? And this first one is, is I mean, silly. This is 1 half x. The other of these, because the argument of this thing is a is a just a, a multiple of x, it's 10x. Hopefully you remember that we have sort of a shortcut for that. We do 1 tenth, and then we recall that the integral of cosine is sine 10x plus c. If you weren't comfortable with what happened right there, remember that all you're really doing is making your u 10x, which means your du is 10 dx, which means your dx will be 1 tenth du. That, that's, this here sort of explains why this 1 tenth appears out here. It's a shortcut that we have for doing fairly simple um, u substitutions. So if I put all this together, we end up with 1 half x minus 1 20th sine 10x plus c. Okay. These were three examples of how we can use trigonometric identities to help us to either rewrite problems or to do use substitutions or to work through problems like that. Um, I do have several other videos that I've linked with this. Um, so if you need to see more examples or if you want to see, sort of get more examples or get more practice with it, please, please feel free to go through those. But these three examples will hopefully give you a sense for how to begin practice using these identities uh, to help you through integration.